Hey MedGeekers, Caitlin here. And for this week's video, I thought we would cover ACLS. Um, I had recently needed to get recertification for my ACLS, so I thought while it was fresh in my brain that we could do a quick review video for this. So let's get started. So I just want to first of all say that this is in no way um, a replacement for the ACLS class, nor is this in any way a comprehensive review of all the information. I really just wanted to go through and give you a lot of quick pearls to help you get that recertification. Um, so first, let's start with some recognition of rhythms. Now let's start off with an easier rhythm. What do you guys see here? Great. This is VTAC. And the treatment of VTAC is all dependent on if the patient has a pulse or not and if they are stable or not. So if this is pulseless VTAC, then these patients need to be shocked. And by shocked, I mean defibrillation. If the patient has a pulse and they are stable, vital sign-wise and symptom-wise, then these patients can simply be given an antiarrhythmic like amiodarone. But if they are symptomatic or unstable vital signs-wise and this is their rhythm, then they need to go through synchronized cardioversion. So what rhythm do you see here? Great, this is VFib. And the treatment for VFib is similar to pulseless VTAC in that you need to shock them. And this is unsynchronized cardioversion. Remember, VFib and pulseless VTAC are the only shockable rhythms. So what rhythm do you see here? Great, this is torsade supportives. And the treatment for this is usually just IV magnesium because the most common cause of this rhythm is hypomagnesia. Now, what AV block do you see here? Great, this is the first degree AV block. And you can tell because every QRS has a P associated and there are no dropped beats. But in this rhythm, the PR interval is greater than one big box. What AV block do you see here? Awesome. This is the second degree Mobitz type one, or also called a winky Bach rhythm. You can tell because the PR interval is slowly lengthening with every QRS, and then suddenly there's a drop in a beat. Kind of like it's winking at you and it's about to drop, AKA winky Bach. Now what rhythm do you see here? Awesome. This is the second degree Mobitz type two. And you can tell because there's a P to every QRS but there's no increased lengthening like before, and then all of a sudden, there's a drop. Now what's the last AV block we haven't talked about yet? Awesome, this is the third degree AV block, and you can tell because the P's and the QRS's are beating completely separate from each other. So that means the atrium is beating on its own and the ventricle is beating on its own, and there is no association between them. So you should have similar length between the P's and the QRS's. When it comes to testing for AV blocks, make sure that you can recognize each AV block and its specific degree on the written exam, but when it comes to the procedural mega code, um, if the patient's having bradycardia and they're symptomatic, it's easy. You don't really need to recognize what degree of AV block, you just need to give them atropine. And if the patient does not respond to this, you need to transcutaneously pace them. Um, and then obviously first degree and uh, winky Bach usually do not require treatment, um, but the definitive treatment for um, Mobitz type two and third degree AV blocks um, is that pacemaker. And then when it comes to uh, ventricular rhythms like VTAC or VFib, um, make sure you know how to treat them all individually. Um, when it comes to VTAC, you need to figure out if the patient is um, pulseless or pulse, or has a pulse, and you need to figure out if they are stable or unstable. And then um, with VFib, you obviously need to shock them. Never forget to shock a shockable rhythm. Now I really just want to go through a lot of pearls for the written exam. Uh, a lot of us know how to do an ACLS protocol and to run a mega code. Um, it's the written exam that kind of gets to us sometimes. So let's get started with that. So if your patient comes in and they have this crossing, chest pain, um, feels like an elephant sitting on their chest, it radiates down their left arm, they have associated numbness or tingling in their fingers, uh, some nausea, some diaphoresis, and associated shortness of breath. This obviously sounds like coronary artery syndrome, so what dose of aspirin do you want to give them? 
So the recommended dose is 160 to 325. Good job, guys. I usually just give 325, which is actually just four 81 milligram pills of aspirin. Also, the timing for diagnosis and treatment of coronary artery disease and strokes was also discussed on the written exam, and remembering these times is very important. So uh, a couple of things like the dorsal needle time for strokes, the dorsal needle time for STEMIs, and the dorsal balloon time for STEMIs, and then what diagnostic study is needed within 25 minutes of a suspected stroke. Great, guys. The dorsal needle time for a stroke is 60 minutes, and that is to receive TPA. And TPA is indicated in STEMIs as well, sometimes when you don't have access to a coronary perfusion center, and that is indicated in 30 minutes for STEMIs. The door to balloon time, if the patient was to receive um, cardiac catheterization, is 90 minutes for STEMIs, and then you're going to want to grab a non-contrasted CT for a suspected stroke in 25 minutes in these patients. So a couple questions were asked about ventilating a patient. So what's the main downside of hyperventilating a patient? And then after you've placed an advanced airway in a patient in need, what do you need the end tidal CO2 to be at? So the main downside of hyperventilating a patient is decreased cardiac output. Because of that increased thoracic pressure, you should only squeeze approximately half of the bag at a time or 500 to 600 cc's of air at a time. And after you've placed an advanced airway in a patient, you want the entitled CO2 to be between 35 to 40 milligrams per Hg. So next question is, how often during a code can you reanalyze the rhythm? And how often can you give one milligram of epi? Great. So you can reanalyze the rhythm every two minutes, and you can give one milligram of epi every three minutes. Now they love to ask a lot of questions about ROSC, which is the return of spontaneous circulation. So after a patient has been in VFib and they have return of spontaneous circulation, where does the EMS need to consider taking this patient? And then at what temperature do you need to cool the patient after they have return of spontaneous circulation if the patient is not responding to you? Great. So you need to take these patients to a coronary reperfusion center. The most common cause of VFib is coronary artery syndrome. So these patients will most likely need a cath lab. And then great, the cooling temperature needs to be between 32 to 36 degrees Celsius. And that's it guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, I hope this helps you with your recertification or your first time certification of ACLS. Um, see you guys next week. Thank you.